This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I've gotten to know John Janicek a little bit through the New York Numismatic Club, and it's my pr- pleasure to introduce him as our long table speaker this afternoon. Uh, he's been collecting coins since uh, the age of six and specializes in the 20th century German Empire coinage and has spoken on this subject at the 2020 uh, Newman Numismatic Portal Symposium, as well as to the New York and Trenton Numismatic Clubs. Uh, John is retired from the New Jersey Department of Corrections and is currently employed by Educational Testing Service. Uh, he holds a master's degree in administrative science from uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. And John and his wife, Beverly, have two g- grown children and reside in central New Jersey with their three cats. His three cats are also regular attendees to the ANS long tables. You'll often see them on the screen. Uh, mine would love to attend these too, but Jill doesn't let them come to the office. So uh, anyway, yes, it's Jill's fault. <laughs> All right, John, please take it away. Okay, so I'll be talking today about German Empire coinage of the 20th century, focusing on the free Hanseatic cities and the colonies. And uh, there are a few of the coins I'll be talking about during my presentation. Um, Briefly, what was the German Empire? Well, it existed from 1871 until 1918. It was founded in the uh, later days of the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, It came crashing down in late 1918, um, in the closing days of World War I. It was a constitutional monarchy, sort of. It had some totalitarian tendencies, definitely. Uh, The ruler was a Kaiser or emperor. He was also the king of Prussia, which was the largest and most powerful of the states composing the empire. And the Kaiser from the time period we're gonna talk about today, which is basically 1901 to 1918, was Wilhelm II, who is shown to the, on the screen there, wearing one of his over 300 military uniforms. That'll become relevant a little more later of military pageantry. Uh, So the empire consists of 25 states, ranging from kingdoms, uh, Prussia, which is very large kingdoms, to very small principalities, and most importantly, the three free Hanseatic cities of Bremen, Hamburg, and Lübeck that we're gonna be talking about in the first part of my presentation. Uh, This map of Northern Germany shows the three cities. We have Bremen and Hamburg are, uh, Funding on the North Sea, Lubeck is a Baltic Sea port. Now, talking about free Hanseatic cities, um, these are vestiges of two defunct institutions. The free cities part come from the Holy Roman Empire, wherein cities that achieved a certain level of wealth and power could be receive autonomy internally, but still be under the uh, overall control of the emperor, but they wouldn't have a direct feudal overlord. Uh, So that's the free city part. The Hanseatic city part came from the Hanseatic League. Uh, Hansa is German for guild. So this was association of merchants and ship owners who came to dominate a seaborne traffic in the Baltic and North Seas, roughly from the late 1200s to the mid 1600s. By 1871, the Hanseatic League had faded away, but the three cities retained it as a honorable title. Um, So at one point there were dozens of free cities in the uh, Holy Roman Empire, but by 1871, there were only three free cities left, three three I'm going to talk about today. Now, uh, so they were the only three states in the German Empire that did not have dynastic rulers, a king or a grand duke. They were uh, instead ruled by a sort of quasi-democratic oligarchy uh, where they had a uh, legislature and uh, from among the number of members of the legislature, they would select a mayor or burgermeister to be the chief executive officer in the city in a year or two. Um, so monetary system of the empire was based on the mark. This is equivalent to about 22 US cents, which makes a mark coin, a silver coin, 900 fine, a tiny bit smaller than a a US quarter dollar. 
uh, Mark was divided into 100 Fenny. Now, Mark replaced a hodgepodge of different currencies, tailors and crowns and shillings. So this was a very good thing. It kept the whole empire, you know, with one monetary system. Um, coins were struck in these different denominations, one and two fenning in copper, five and 10 in copper nickel, uh, 25 fenning in nickel, uh, silver, 50 fenning or half mark, mark two, three and five marks and gold 10 and 20. Um, so the minor coinage of the empire uh, were struck to uh, uniform designs and they were uniform throughout the entire period um, with one exception that I'll get to in a minute. So these coins from one fennec to one mark were struck in the name of the entire empire. The larger coins, which I'll get to in a minute, were struck by the individual states because they retained some degrees of autonomy under the empire. And one of the rights they retained was to be able to strike certain coins. So these are examples of the minor coins. We have a copper one fennec on the left, very simple, straightforward design. Deutsches Reich, German state, uh, 1905, one Fennig. On the other side, we have the Imperial Eagle, and you can barely see underneath the Eagle, the J mint mark of the Hamburg mint. Uh, the empire had six mints. Uh, we're only gonna be talking about coins that were struck at either the Berlin mint with mint mark A or the Hamburg mint, mint mark J. To the right is a one mark coin. Again, simple, straightforward design. They just added the wreath for aesthetic purposes because it's a larger coin. It's about the size of US quarter. And again, has the Imperial Eagle and again, the J mint mark of the Hamburg mint. Now I mentioned that there was another coin uh, from a different design. And here we have uh, the 25 Fennec. And the reason my title is the other 1909 wheat year coin is simply because 1909, the United States released the Lincoln Cent, the wheat year motif. Um, there was one big difference between the Lincoln Cent and the German 25 Fennec. The 25 Fennec was an absolute failure. Uh, no one liked them for some reason. Um, it possibly because they were very similar in size to the Mark coins. Uh, only one millimeter apart, kind of like the issue that U.S. had with the quarter and the small size silver dollars, or uh, excuse me, the copper nickel dollars. So um, that's possibly the reason why they were unsuccessful. But I think it has a rather attractive design. I think sort of an Art Nouveau thing going on. See the wheat ear motif, uh, the denomination, again, the J mint mark of the, of the Hamburg mint, uh, Deutsches Reich and the date. Uh, a little bit different of an imperial eagle. They said, I find it a pleasing design, but apparently the German people did not care for it. It was only struck from 1909 to 1912 in decreasingly, uh, decreasing numbers, and uh, they finally did away with it. Now, I mentioned that the individual states retained some degrees of autonomy, and one of the rights that they kept was the right to strike larger coins. So we're talking right here about the two, three, and five mark silver coins. Uh, we'll also talk about the gold coins in a minute. Now I divide these coins into three basic categories. Uh, first is commemorative coins. If you look at the coin on the bottom, this is a, the large five mark piece. Uh, this is a commemorative coin it was struck in the name of the um, Ducky of Anhalt. It shows it's struck in honor of the 25th wedding anniversary of Duke Friedrich and his wife Marie, the Herzog und Herzogin von Anhalt, Duke and Duchess of Anhalt. Um, so some of the monarchical states struck these commemorative coins for various reasons, similar to the U.S. commemorative coins of about that time period. Um, wedding anniversaries, the deaths of rulers. Uh, several feature uh, anniversaries of major universities. So, um, so that's the first category, commemorative coins. And, and so this five mark piece is a rather large crown. It's actually slightly a bit larger than a US silver dollar. 
Now going down, we have the three mark piece here. That's intermediate in size between the US half dollar, silver dollar. And this is what I like to term the standard issue monarchical coins. Very similar to other European coins of the uh, time. We have the ruler, in this case, Leopold, Prince of Lippe, uh, surrounded by his titles, Leopold the First, Fürst der Lippe. Fürst is ruling prince, as opposed to prince, which would be the son of a monarch. Uh, underneath the bust is the A mint mark of the Berlin mint. Uh, Lippe being a very small state with a population of only about 150,000, certainly didn't have their own mint, so they contracted with the Berlin mint for their coinage. And the reverse is, again, we're pretty much a standard a reverse for a European coin of this period, featuring a large heraldic symbol, in this case, the Imperial Eagle, uh, Deutsches Reich, German state, the year 1913, and the denomination Dreimark. Now, the free Hanseatic cities didn't have monarchs being ruled by a Senate and a Burgermeister. So in lieu of a, the image of a monarch, they had elements of their coats of arms on the coins. And I'm gonna briefly touch on the gold coins and then I'm going to break down the coat of arms a little bit. The gold coinage was struck in two denominations, a 10 mark, also colloquially known as a crone, which is a coin slightly smaller than a US two and a half dollar gold piece and 20 marks, uh, also known as a doppel crown colloquially and uh, slightly smaller than US $5 gold piece. Uh, they had also struck a five mark piece, um, but that was only in the 1870s and they were discontinued long before 1901. So, and they, again, they bear the exact same designs as the regular coins. Uh, there were no gold commemoratives struck. All right, so now I'm gonna go over the, uh, coats of arms of the three free Hanseatic cities because they are the basic design elements of the coins. And of the, the three coins we're about to show you now from Bremen, Hamburg, and Lübeck all had the exact same standard Imperial Eagle reverse. So I didn't feel any need to show that. So I'm gonna read the heraldic description of the coat of arms, and then I will translate that into normal. The so Bremen's coat of arms consisted of a leaf coronet of five and jewels, a key argent with supporters, two lions, rampant, regardant, or langed jewels. Or a non heraldic term, a crown above a shield with a silver key, supported by two golden lions uh, with red tongues, their heads turned to the rear. Uh, this is one of two appearances by members of the Cat family on 20th century German Empire coins um, and my obligatory Cat reference. Um, so uh, the key, so the crown represents the fact that even though it, Bremen is a free city, it is still under the authority of the emperor. And the key would seem to be a worthwhile symbol uh, for a city of merchants who would tend to keep their inventory under lock and key, but it actually represents the keys of St. Peter, who was the patron saint of the city's cathedral. Um, and again, the obverse just says, Frei Hansa Stadt Bremen, free in Hanseatic city of Bremen. And underneath is the J mint mark of the Hamburg mint, where all of Bremen's coins were sold. Bremen being a relatively small city, 320,000 people. Um, they actually only struck coins in three years, 1904, 1906, and 1907. And they used the denominations of two, five, 10, and 20 mark. They didn't produce any three marks and only a total of 190,000 coins, which makes this coins of Bremen, especially the gold coins, pretty rare. But this shows that the people and the city fathers of Bremen had a great deal of civic pride that they wanted coins featuring their city to be in circulation. Uh, most of the German states uh, struck coins, only two of the 25 didn't, and they were also very small states. Moving on to 
free Hanseatic city of Hamburg, uh, heraldically, coat of arms is three peacock feathers and six banners of arms and a mantling argent and jewels. And jewels, a castle triple turreted argent, two lions rampant regarded or langed jewels. Or as we can see on the right, we have a, a three turreted castle in a shield surmounted by a knight's helmet, uh, supported by two gold lions with red tongues. Uh, the knight's helmet and the city walls um, represent Hamburg's uh, willingness to defend itself against all enemies. Um, and the lions are the second appearance of members of the cat family on German coins. Now, Hamburg struck all their own coins. See the J mint mark underneath the uh, coat of arms. Uh, they struck millions of coins of all different denominations from one pfennig to 20 mark. Uh, they're, they're the most common by far of the free city coins. Actually stuck, struck coins for two other states in addition. And Hamburg was by far the busiest port in the German Empire and is still the third busiest port in Europe. A uh, population of Hamburg at this period was approximately 1,100,000 people. So a very thriving city. Uh, a lot of merchant shipping traffic, uh, had a navy yard, a lot of shipyards to build and repair ships, a very bustling, busy city. We go to the free city of Lübeck. Now, Lübeck has an interesting coat of arms that I'll describe here. Or a double-headed eagle sabre, overall an escutcheon par for fess argent ou jules. So a gold shield, bearing a black two-headed eagle with a shield on its chest, showing silver over red. Um, it's interesting as the reverse of this coin has the standard imperial eagle on it. So it has a two-headed eagle on the obverse and a one-headed eagle on the reverse, making the Lubeck coins very interesting to me. Uh, again, Frey and Hansestadt Lubeck, free in Hanseatic city of Lubeck. And underneath is the A mint mark of the Berlin man. Berlin struck all of Lubeck's coins uh, for the simple reason Lubeck was a relatively small city of only 120,000 people, did not have its own mint. And uh, as the map showed earlier, Lubeck being a Baltic seaport is actually a good bit closer to Berlin than it is to Hamburg. So it made sense for them to contract with the Hamburg mint for their uh, coinage. Now we have something different. You know, I'm here talking about coins of the free Hanseatic cities. This is clearly a Prussian coin, Prussian 20 mark piece. The one on the left shows Kaiser Wilhelm II with his titles, Deutscher Kaiser, Konig von Preussen, German Emperor, King of Prussia. Underneath is the A mint mark of the Berlin mint, where almost all Prussian coins were struck. The coin on the right, identical in basically every detail, although it's a better example of the time, but it has a Jamie. So for some reason, and this is something I'm definitely going to do further research into, Hamburg Mints produced 20 mark gold pieces for Prussia in 1905, 1906, 1909, 1910, and 1912, uh, identical to the Berlin Mint issues except for the Mint Mark. Uh, I said, I'm going to do further research on this subject, but I can only speculate that Berlin, which struck coins both for Prussia, the largest, richest of the states, as well as many of the other states was just backlogged. And Hamburg had some excess capacity and stepped up to meet demand. But again, that's something I definitely want to look more into and uh, hopefully I'll uh, pass on whatever I find. So that basically is the coin struck in and for and by the three, three Hanseatic cities. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, talk about some history before I get into the colonial. Now, one thing we have to realize about the German empire it was a very young country. I mean, it was founded in 1871, even the, very young United States 
history dates back 95 more years. If you think of US independence as taking place in 1776, which is usually what we like to say. Um, so the empire was very young in 1901, only 30 years old. And it had a lot of problems internally. Um, one of the reasons being um, in 1866, when this man in the upper left corner, uh, Prince Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of Prussia, he was the most influential figure in German unification and in the first days of the empire. When he led Prussia and her allies into war with Austria in 1866 and Austria's allies, Austria's allies were German states, which ended up being component states of the German empire. So, and that's the war of 1866 is represented here in this picture in the middle showing a cavalry encounter during the battle of Koniggratz, which was the decisive Prussian victory of the war. So in 1901, 35 years earlier, parts of the German empire had been shooting at each other. Now we think about the United States, our civil war ended the year before that in 1865, and there are still unresolved issues going back to the civil war. So we can just imagine how recent these wounds were to many of the German people. Uh, another issue was religious. And I have the image of uh, Pope Pius IX here in the uh, lower corner, who is the uh, pontiff of the Catholic church at the time. Uh, after German unification, Bismarck, getting back to him, decided that the Catholic Church had too much power in Prussia, so he got the legislature, the Reichstag, to pass a series of uh, laws uh, infringing on the power and rights of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church naturally pushed back. And this led to what was called the Kulturkampf, the culture war, which took place roughly 1872 to 1878 where Bismarck tried to put his thumb on the Catholic Church. Uh, actually, Bismarck ended up having to back off for a variety of reasons, mostly to do with politics. But still, this led to a lot of ill feeling in Germany, because Germany you know, has a, a Catholic Protestant mix. Generally speaking, more Protestants live in the North, more Catholics in the South. But there was certainly a large Catholic population in Russia. So people don't like when you infringe upon their religion. So uh, this again, more discord, more disharmony within the empire. The third major issue um, was political. Now you think Germany, especially Prussia, which is the dominant state, was a very still kind of feudal. They didn't have actual serfs, but the peasant farmers were much better off than medieval serfs necessarily. Um, so the large landowners, exemplified again by Bismarck, who was both a nobleman and a large landowner, the aristocracy, especially the well-known Prussian Junkers landowners, um, they tended to be very conservative, if not reactionary in their politics. They had been running the show for hundreds of years, and they weren't very willing to share their power. So that certainly led to a lot of trouble. Then this was a time of prosperity in Germany. Uh, Germany was thriving through uh, trade, uh, huge industries in dyes, munitions, uh, great advance in, in metallurgy. Um, so Germany was thriving, which led to a prosperous and growing middle class, some of which members were becoming extremely rich, you know, millionaires, even in Marx. Uh, so these affluent people wanted uh, political power and social status commensurate with their wealth. And that led to a lot of ill feelings between this rising middle class and a very defensive aristocracy. And many of these battles, political battles, were fought in the Reichstag, which is shown here in the lower uh, middle. Uh, the German parliament building, where the different political factions would struggle. And then, of course, in any country, you have a working class, which is exemplified in picture to the right, which shows in the foreground 
uh, workers housing and in the background the Krupp plant at Essen uh, producers of massive amounts of munitions guns armor ammunition sold not just to the German government but throughout the world uh, so this working class they wanted their share of prosperity they wanted their share of political power many of them were espousing socialistic and communistic views so again a lot of discord here and even though there were certainly German nationals nationalists who felt that they were Germans first a lot of the people probably a majority thought of themselves as citizens of their state first you ask someone they would say I'm Bavarian I'm Prussian rather than saying I'm German so so a lot of discord factionalism sectionalism so empire had a lot of issues and another major issue it had was its ruler the very troubled arrogant vain bombastic jingoistic Kaiser Wilhelm II shown here in a few more of his more than 300 years. There's two important things that I think we, we need to uh, look at when you're talking about Kaiser Wilhelm II and his personality. First is he had a very difficult birth. He almost died during his birth. And in the process, his left arm was badly twisted. Uh, it never developed properly. It actually ended up being six inches shorter than his right arm when he was a an adult and extremely undeveloped. So if you notice in pictures that either you don't see his left hand, or if you see it, he's got his right hand over it, or it's wasting on the hilt of the sword. So this was obviously caused him a great deal of psychological torment, which he made up for with his arrogance and bombastic nature and by his wearing of military uniforms. So from left to right here, we have him in the uniform of the death head hussars. Next, with his left hand on the hilt of his sword, the uniform of his bodyguard. Uh, the far right shows him in the uniform of a staff officer. Again, he's grasping his left hand and his right hand to mask its um, difference in size. Another issue, that Kaiser Wilhelm had was his relationship with Great Britain, which was a love-hate relationship with Great Britain. One thing we have to understand is that he was a member of the British royal family. He was a grandson of Queen Victoria. Uh, the picture in the middle, he's seen wearing the uniform of a British Admiral of the Fleet. Uh, and he's there with his uncle, Edward VII, also wearing the uniform of an Admiral of very common for royalty in those days to give each other honorary ranks. So Wilhelm had a great deal of respect for Great Britain, which we have to understand is the world's greatest power at this time. Richest country, largest colonial empire, largest navy. Over time, Wilhelm's respect for Britain turned to envy, very deep and raw envy which ended up being one of many factors that led to World War I, but it was certainly uh, important. And Wilhelm, and he thought, he, he acted without thinking, he wrote speeches, he spoke without thinking, very rash, impulsive person. Now, um, so I was talking about issues that the empire had, the disunity. Now, when Kaiser Wilhelm takes the throne in 1888, uh, what happened is grandfather Wilhelm I died early in the year. His father, Frederick, who was already terminally sick with cancer, died later in 1888. So he comes to the throne as a young, relatively young man in his 20s um, with this envy of Great Britain. Now, uh, Otto von Bismarck was still the chancellor, but when Wilhelm II took the throne, he decided he wanted to take policies his way. Bismarck resisted him, and he finally forced Bismarck to resign two years later. So after that, he had a series of relatively weak chancellors and other advisors, and he 
had a great deal, sort of undue amount of influence over the government. Um, now, as part of his envy of the British Empire and the Royal Navy, he decided that he wanted a powerful Navy. Before uh, he took the throne, the German Imperial Navy was just a small coast defense force whose whole purpose was to protect the flank of the army, the seaborne flank. Uh, when he takes power, he decides he wants a navy that can rival the Royal Navy. And he built a very powerful navy. At one point, became the second most powerful navy in the world in the early 20th century, just behind the uh, Royal Navy. And in World War I, they challenged the Royal Navy. They failed, but they certainly tried very hard. But one thing about the Imperial Navy, it was a uniquely imperial institution. Remember, I said that the individual states retained certain degrees of autonomy. Well, part of that was control, certain amount of control over the different armies. The Prussia would have its own army. Bavaria had its own army. They certainly served together in the field, but had a lot of state control. The Imperial Navy was specifically imperial. Uh, the ships bore the prefix SMS, signed the Majesty's ship, His Majesty's ship. So it was a uniquely imperial institution. And in these, you know, these are talking about very different times more than 100 years ago. People took a great deal of pride in having a powerful Navy. And that pride was one of the unifying factors that the government was uh, trying to use to build a imperial patriotism and unity to offset all the issues that were driving the people apart. So the powerful navy was a great source of pride. And you see here two postcards. People being proud of their navy would buy these postcards to display or to send to people. Um, so it served as a source of unity. Now, another way that navies can promote imperial or national unity is by the um, naming ships after parts of the country. We saw that in the United States. Battleships were traditionally named after states. Cruisers are named after cities. Well, German Navy was very similar. Many of the battleships were named after states. You see here, battleship SMS Preussen. Preussen means Prussia. Uh, light cruisers, which were the most numerous named ships, uh, were named after cities. In this case, the famous Emden of World War I, uh, named after a port city in northern Germany. Um, and they didn't just name a ship after the city. They would try to build a relationship between the people of the city and the ship. They would always invite a delegation from the city to uh, the launching and christening of the ship. And in fact, all of these ships were christened, well, the light cruisers at least, were christened by the burgermeister of the town themselves. And that also extended, of course, to the free Hanseatic cities. So from Top to bottom, we have SMS Bremen, SMS Hamburg, and SMS Lubeck, uh, late cruisers, the Imperial Navy, uh, built before World War I, which saw service in World War I. Again, this, using the Navy as an imperial institution to build unity and fellow feel between the Navy and the state, and hopefully all the people of Germany to have a fellow feel. Now, there were an, another uniquely imperial institution, German colonies. Before 1871, uh, Germany, Prussia had no colonies. And in fact, during the early years of um, the empire, Chancellor von Bismarck had no use for colonies. He felt they were a distraction from the important politics and diplomatic maneuvering of the day, which would take place in Europe and could lead to trouble between German and other countries, uh, squabbles over colonial borders, things like that. He didn't feel the need first. And after a few years, in the uh, later 1870s and early 1880s, he thought a bit. So Germany did start lightly acquiring certain colonies. Uh, but Bismarck really didn't have his heart in it, but he did see they could possibly be useful for um, uh, 
trade purposes. He could use them as pawns in his political maneuverings and also uh, a uh, place for Germany's excess population. So rather than coming to Ellis Island and becoming American citizens, they could go to one of the German colonies perhaps and remain German subjects. So uh, but when Wilhelm II took the throne in 1888, and again, when he assumed more power in 1890 after the departure of Bismarck, Germany really got heavily into the colonial race. So this map shows well, up in Europe, you can see that's Germany itself. In Africa, we have um, the black territories are Togo, Cameroon, German Southwest Africa, and German East Africa. And then uh, in Asia and the Pacific, can't really, I don't really see it. Uh, on the coast of China was Chow Chow. And they also own part of New Guinea, part of Samoa, and Caroline and Marshall Islands. So groups of small islands. Um, so this was a German colonial empire from 1901 until 1914. So getting back to numismatics, uh, three of these colonies had produced coins. New Guinea had coins struck, but they were all in the 1890s, so are outside the scope of today's talk, although a fascinating subject in their own right. Uh, but the two continents which produced coins were first German East Africa. German East Africa is located obviously in East Africa, it is today the nation of Tanzania for the most part. Um, it was uh, monetary value of unit was the rupee, obviously something that they picked up from India, which was uh, the money used in this area when the Germans acquired. So the, uh, this is, are the different designs of coins of German East Africa. The uh, left upper, we have a one Heller bronze coin. Uh, Coins of this design were struck in the domination of one half one and five heller, um, the first design of five heller, they were later changed. Uh, so Deutsche Ostafrika, German East Africa, the date. And in the center is the imperial crown. Imperial crown has two um, basic importances here. One is, again, imperial crown. This does not belong to any of the states. This is imperial possession. And back then, in the, it was a very colonialistic, imperialistic age. People took pride in having a large colonial empire. You know, colonialism wasn't the bad word that it is today. People, you know, they said the sun never set on the British Empire, for instance. The German Chancellor von Bülow stated Germany needed their place in the sun. So the idea of the more powerful a country is, the more colonies it has. And to many people, not everyone, but to many people, this was a source of pride. Um, the second thing about, interesting thing about the imperial crown is that it was never actually made. Obviously a design was made, because you can see it right here on the coin, but they never actually constructed the crown. They made a, a prototype in base metal, but the actual crown in uh, precious metals encrusted with jewels was never made. Uh, the reverse, very simple. We have the denomination one Heller and the mint mark J within a wreath. Something straightforward. To the right, uh, this represents the uh, larger coins, um, five Heller and 10 Heller, later issues of the five Heller in copper nickel um, and 20 Heller. Um, again, we have the imperial crown, the date, Deutsche Ostafrika, and reverse. Two little sprigs of uh, greenery and the denomination. Hold coins were pretty common in colonial possessions of this day. Certainly, uh, quite a few British colonial coins. Holds in them. Uh, the bottom coin again shows Kaiser Wilhelm II in one of his military uniforms. In fact, this is probably his fanciest uniform of his bodyguard. Uh, has a white tunic heavily embroidered in gold, uh, wearing a polished steel breastplate or cuirass uh, with big fancy epaulets and a whole bunch of medals that he never earned. 
Uh, the headdress is a polished uh, steel helmet with an eagle perched upon it with outstretched wings. So, a very fancy and impressive uniform. And has his titles in and his name in Latin, Guillermus II Imperator, um, not uncommon in coins of this period. In fact, British coins still have the king's titles. Uh, the reverse of the silver coins again has a uh, tropical looking wreath. Uh, Ost Africa, this coin is a quarter rupee, uh, probably a little bit bigger than a US dime. And 1910 date and the J. Mark of Now, in 1914, when Germany went to war, so did its colonies. Um, so, German East Africa was invaded by the British. Fortunately for German East Africa, the commander of its military force or Schutztruppe was a brilliant uh, soldier, Colonel, later General Paul von Lettel Vorbeck. He actually managed to lead his undersupplied, uh, badly outnumbered army throughout the entire war, only turned himself and his army in in late November 1918 after the British convinced him that the armistice had been signed and the war was over. Now, during this campaign that lasted more than four years, um, Germany has ever had almost no contact with Germany, almost no supplies. The Germans did manage to sneak two supply ships filled with munitions down to uh, von Lettel Warbeck, but that was a drop in the bucket compared to the needs of his army. So they turned to improvisation, as well as beating the British and taking their guns and ammunition, which they did quite a bit. So in 1916, having run out of money, uh, they set up a mint in the town of Tabora in uh, German East Africa, a base, just a little village it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. They built a mint in a railroad car powered by steam from the locomotive. And with just hand tools and very primitive machine tools, they struck uh, 300,000 five heller coins in brass to a design similar to the coin on the left. 1,900,000 of the 20 heller coins, which you can see to the left in copper and brass. And it is a, a simple sort of rudimentary design, but not bad for being in the middle of nowhere with crude tools. They also struck 16,015 rupee coins in gold. Now, 15 rupees is important because that's basically, that's the size of an English sovereign, 15 rupees in gold. And people were very familiar with British sovereigns. So the reason they struck 16,000 of these is because he wanted to give one to each of his soldiers. And at the time, his army consisted of about 16,000 men. By the time he had to surrender, his army had dwindled to maybe 1,000 men. But it was still a great accomplishment to keep these men fighting throughout the war. Now, I think the uh, gold coin is very impressive. Slightly crude, but we have a... Uh, Elephant with mountains in the background, 1916 date, T for Tabura Mint. And the reverse has the Imperial Eagle, uh, Deutsche Africa, and the denomination, and all in all for being uh, struck under such difficult conditions. Very important coinage. Now, I mentioned there was one other colony which had coins. So now we go halfway around the world to Kalchau, a, a port area on the Yellow Sea in uh, coastal China. Now in the late 1900s, early 20th century, um, or 1800s, early 1900s, China was in a state of extreme disarray, very weak central government, torn by factionalism, uh, the European powers in Japan, uh, ripping off pieces of territory. The uh, English obviously had Hong Kong, the Russians seized Port Arthur, and then later the, China, the Japanese took it. Um, well, Kaiser Wilhelm, naturally enough, in his envious state decided he was entitled to a piece of Chinese territory. So in 1897, he used the pretext, the murder of two German missionaries in Shantung province, which is the province that includes this area seen on the map, um, 
So the murder of these two missionaries, he ordered his naval squadron, which was already in Chinese waters anyway, to seize the city of Qindao, um, which is uh, right in the center of here. It's a, an excellent port. Uh, so the city is known as Qindao, and the territory around it is known as Kelchao, and that's all in Shantung province of China. So uh, after the naval force seized the port, uh, the German government forced the Chinese government to lease this area to them for 99 years. So the Germans were then formally in possession of it. And the first thing they did was build a brewery, which is still there, producing beer. It's the original German recipe. Um, and they established a bank, the uh, Asiatische Bank, or German Asiatic Bank, as the monetary authority. Um, now, at the time in China, silver money ruled the day. And the most important silver coinage that they used was the Mexican silver peso, or as they generally referred to it, the Mexican dollar. The Deutsche Asiatische Bank was very happy to tra transact their business in. Um, Mexican dollars they're being common in the area. Uh, but in 1909, they realized they needed some small change. So they contracted with the Berlin Mint to produce some small change, five and 10, uh, 610,000 five cent pieces and 670,000 10 cent pieces in copper nickel. And those are shown here. Now, these are very interesting coins. Certainly on an imperial German coin, you expect the imperial eagle, which is seen here. But the anchor, that's certainly odd, but there's a very good reason for the anchor. Gaochao was not technically a colony as it wasn't under the imperial colonial office. It was under the imperial naval office. It was owned lock, stock and barrel by the Navy. Its purpose was to be a fortified trade, port and naval base for Germany in the Far East. So that's why I had the anchor, because this was a, a naval possession. The governor was a serving naval officer. The port was garrisoned by Imperial Marines and naval artillerymen, purely naval concern. And of course, the Navy was Imperial only and did not answer any, to any of the individual states. And so the inscription on the coins, obverse, Deutsch Kelchau Gebiet. Gebiet basically means territory, which makes sense because it was the least territory, not technically a colony. So German Kelchau territory uh, has the denomination on either side of the eagle and anchor and the date below, 1909. And the reverse, interesting enough for a German coin, is in Chinese. And the um, translation that I have reads, Qindao, Great German Empire's Currency. This is for the, the five cent. Five fen, every 20 pieces is worth one yuan. So the dollar. So these, these are, I have both of these coins in my collection and they're among my favorites. Very interesting slice of history. Sure. And um, so what happened to Kao Chao is in 1914, the, uh, the Japanese declared war on uh, Germany. Uh, they took Kao Chao and the city of Jindao after a short but bloody siege. And in, uh, after the war, it just reverted back to Chinese control. Today, the city of Jindao is a thriving port city of the People's Republic of China. And uh, one of its leading exports is beer produced in the old German brewery to the German, uh, original German recipe, which I think is best. Uh, well, that's really all I have here. So I will say thank you very much. And are there any questions, uh, both in English and in German? So uh, please, I'd uh, be very happy to uh, listen to anything anyone has to say or any question. Uh, John, I'd like to ask a question. Okay, um, I'm going to... I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, okay. Um, what's your source for the beautiful images in this presentation? The internet. 
Ah. And uh, for a second question, what's the standard reference book for this coinage? Um, well, there's certainly the standard catalog of world coins, standard catalog of German coins, but um, this little tiny tome, Die Deutschen Reichsmunzen seit 1871, by Kurt Jaeger. Uh, my copy is Basel, 1965, but this is the uh, standard um, reference book. Um, uh, really, uh, there isn't a tremendous amount of interest in German coins, I find, um, except when I go to an auction when there seems to be a tremendous amount of interest in everything that I'm interested in. <laughs> Danke schön. Yes, can I thank ask you a question? Uh, absolutely, ask? please. Yes, thank you. First, uh, thank you very much for a really excellent overview. I really appreciate this. And uh, my question is um, whether there are any numismatic implications to the German military's admiration of the, uh, uh, the British Navy. And in particular, you know, whether uh, it was popular, for example, to collect things like Admiral Vernon medals, which, um, you know, uh, was a, a naval victory for the British okay. that got lots and lots of attention, tons of uh, coinage, well, uh, tokens that were produced. And um, uh, I've done a bit of research on some German collectors in the 19th century and found uh, at least one individual who was in the uh, uh, Prussian military officer who seemed to widely collect Admiral Vernon medals. And I'm just wondering is, uh, whether uh, there were numismatic implications to that interest in the uh, British Navy. Not that I'm aware of. There were no uh, commemorative. I mean, I only collect coins. I, haven't, haven't, I don't dabble with medals. I can barely afford what I do collect. Uh, but there are no references to any ships uh, or any maritime topics on any German coins. If there were, I would have included them today. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not aware of any of those influences, okay. actually going over to the coin side of things. Okay. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask, ask a quick question. Yes. Um, what is the relationship of a heller to a rupee? One heller, have... 100 heller to one rupee. And the other comment is you were talking about uh, the, you know, the, the large mintage of using Hamburg uh, to mint gold coins. Um, you might wanna consider the fact that the world was on the gold standard and Germany's economy was going so strong that they may have needed to really crank out the, uh, crank out the gold marks uh, because, uh, you know, Russia, I, you know, I, I, I have, I do have the Kaiser in my collection uh, but I, uh, uh, you know, Russia went on the gold standard and all, and all of a sudden started cranking out uh, lots of gold rubles. And I suspect a country that is, is, was doing as well as Germany, they had a money supply challenge and probably were needing to crank out a whole lot of gold marks. Well, that's, that's my speculation is that they just, uh, you know, Berlin was booked up both with Prussian orders and other state orders. Uh, Hamburg had a little surplus capacity, so they, uh, you know, sent a few telegrams. I, 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 I also have the I also have the Kaiser uh, in the 19. I think it's the 1914 marks where he's wearing his military uniform as opposed to his his bust. Yes, uh, 1913 he, he and 1914. Yeah. He certainly thought a lot of himself. Well, that was for his 25th uh, year of his accession to the throne. Ah. So it's a a quasi commemorative, but they kept striking them the next year, making them a little less commemorative. But yes, he loved uniforms. He was an incredibly vague man. They said he would change his uniform perhaps four or five times a day for different reasons. Like if he reviewed, say, the first Grenadier Regiment, he would review them wearing their uniform. And then say he met a foreign dignitary, he'd meet him in the uniform of his country's army. So he wore a lot of you. Thanks. You're welcome. Could I ask a question? 
Yes, please. Uh, before you went to the Marx system in 1871, they had the Teller. Yes. Did they continue to circulate in the cities too? Uh, well, well, this kind of like the three, one Teller coin became the three Mark coin. Right. And it was colloquially called that, but it definitely wasn't the same uh, weight and fineness. Okay. But um, yeah, it was probably, a, a, I would say, a similar situation to early U.S. coinage. The coinage the U.S. Mint didn't drive out Spanish reals from circulation. So it was a, a period of time. But the Germans being very efficient people, I think they, uh, they raked in those tailors, melted them, and turned them into marks pretty quick. And whatever's left are the ones we still have uh, available for collections. Thank you. Oh, I see uh, Eric Krauss had a question about, um, I've observed the German coins at this time do not identify their engravers. What is known of the designers and engravers of these coins and why were they not identified on the pieces by their initials? Um, well, I don't really have a hard and fast answer for that, but uh, the German mint of fish, uh, engravers were, yes, definitely very highly skilled workmen. And they were employees of the mint. And I, like, if I worked at the Ford factory, I wouldn't write my name on every Mustang that I wrote, worked on. I think it was just, they were considered as, you know, workers that did a job. And uh, I'm certain they were certainly uh, well regarded, but they weren't like singled out for praise, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Is there anything else? Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, John, real quickly. Yes. Um, yes, John. Good to see you again so soon. And yes. uh, very entertaining, very informative. Uh, you know, I don't collect any foreign coins, but you made me want to collect German coins just now. And um, but my question is this: When uh, those missionaries were were killed, and then Germany retaliated and they took over the um, the city, I can't pronounce it, but was there a tremendous uh, pushback by the Chinese when they uh, took over part of the continent there? Um, well, the problem was the Chinese government was just so weak. Uh, it didn't, its authority didn't extend very far into the provinces. So the Germans were really dealing with provincial authorities. And if you have, uh, you know, a platoon or a company of highly trained German Marines march into your village and say they're going to take over with the no-nonsense looks on their faces, you're going to do whatever they say, pretty much. I see. Yeah. I was always under the impression China had a uh, very strong central government, but I guess uh, I'm completely yeah. mistaken on that. Yeah, back then it was a disarray. The I Manchu see. government was failing, and then 1911 came the revolution, but the road to the revolution was quite a long one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Very entertaining. Cool. Very entertaining. Thank you, John. Um, I see another question from Kathleen Smith. A few questions. Uh, how do the former German colonies view their period of being a German colony? Do people in those areas collect the coins from that period? I'd say most of the former German colonies look with considerable distaste upon their former overlords. And I don't, I, I imagine that at, the colonial coins that were there and the people have that they would keep them almost as symbols of their the depths to which they had fallen at the times rather than anything of pride. Were there any forgeries? I mean, assume you mean counterfeits? Um, not that I'm aware of specifically, but I mean, people started counterfeiting coins as soon as there were coins, so very likely there were. <laughs> Uh, satirical coins making fun of Wilhelm. Um, there wouldn't be any coins like that. Um, I imagine there were some medals, but that's certainly not my area of expertise. Thanks, John. I'm. This was a great presentation. I'm very curious. For example, if if um, what I mean by the colonies is that if you see examples of people defacing the coins as sort of a oh. way of saying sort of. Um, like uh, I've heard about, you know, the the first and second temple examples with the overstamping, and I was curious if if that was a way for people to sort of say, okay, well, you're gone now, and I'm gonna like 
scratch off Wilhelm's eyes because I'm you know not aware of anything like that. And I would say that the people in these countries are so desperately poor that they would look on any money as being uh, something good. Yeah, no, it's it's such an important area right now, especially since you know, I mean, the German government only recently acknowledged that that was such a, a genocide, and oh, so, yeah. and so, I mean, I'm. I work at a library and we're very interested in also sources because a lot of the sources don't survive. So we have some photographs, we have some uh, what purports to be a painting, but I've never thought of, I did not know that, um, that coins were produced. Oh yeah. That is so fascinating. And thank you so much for a great presentation. I have oh, again, so welcome. many questions. And how did you find the ones that are in your collection? Um, German auctions. Did they, um, were they, are, are people actively collecting these or was it more? Oh, yes, just, oh. absolutely. I, I've been beaten pretty badly at some recent auctions for things like that. So private collectors or do you see institutions or who's who's going I, after these? When I bid, yeah, I bid online, I have no idea who I'm up against, but I would say private collectors primarily. Okay, that is, again, I have, I have so many questions. I would love to oh, talk well, more about this. Uh, yeah, I would love to give you my email address and uh, we could correspond. In fact, I'll speak it right now. Uh, jackcat00 at aol.com. J-A-C-K-C-A-T-0-0 at aol.com. And please, anyone has just wants to talk about German coins, I would be glad to correspond. Great. I have one more question. I'll let yes. other people ask questions. How did you get into collecting these German coins? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I know as a young collector, probably about 10 or 12, I saw a very interesting coin at a local coin show, uh, a long since defunct local coin show in Media, Pennsylvania. It was the 1913 uh, Prussian two mark piece, which commemorates the uh, uh, the king uh, rallying the people to fight against Napoleon, and uh, it's very interesting obverse showing the king surrounded by um, cheering citizens, and the reverse shows an eagle representing Prussia killing a snake representing either Napoleon or the French people, depending on your point of view. And I, that's really what piqued my interest at first, because it was a really fascinating piece and I still have it. And, uh, and of course acquired proof of it. And then they also produced it in free mark. So I have that in proof and regular. So yeah, so I think that was it. And, but uh, someone asked me that yesterday. I think Chuck asked me that yesterday and I couldn't even recall, but I'm pretty sure that's that's what sparked it. So that was, more than 40 years ago. But there's some really interesting coins out there, especially the commemoratives. And, and I've forced myself to stay 20th century just because I can't afford to go back any farther. I, there's a bunch of coins that I want right now that I, I can't afford, but uh, you know, saving my pennies. I, I see one more question, at least one more question. Uh, I wonder if I could, could I make a, a comment Absolutely. on the Cameroons? Uh, yes. Where I live in Frederick, Maryland, I uh, go to the French conversation group and they're from time to time people from the Cameroons where they are speaking French. And I ask them about the period of the German occupation or when the Germans controlled uh, before World War one or I still oh, thank you. and they said they didn't know anything mm -hmm. about it and these people were you know any more news? um this, i think I, st I still have a bunch okay thank you sweetheart they uh yeah that that's fascinating but certain colonies had more german presence than others and cameroon did not have a lot uh, uh They've really just occupied a few key towns. The, so the it's possible the average citizen or den the citizen of a, a village might not even know that the Germans were technically their overlords or whatever. Uh, 
Um, another question, Don Squires, were the local German coinage is legal tender throughout the empire? Yes, absolutely. The coins were all fully convertible. You could take a Bremen five mark, buy anything you wanted with it and get your change in Bavarian two marks and a whole bunch of Fennigs that totally completely interchange. Um, let's see. One mark to 22 cents US related to the weight and the relation stands for gold. Um, yeah, it was uh, obviously in a brief presentation like this, I had to simplify some stuff, but Germany was on the gold standard. Technically, the mark was the gold mark, but everyone just referred to, um, to them as marks. Oh, uh, German New Guinea coins with the fancy bird. They are beautiful and fascinating coins, but they were all struck in the 1890s. So uh, I don't have any in my collection and uh, uh, I didn't talk about them today, but they are beautiful pieces featuring the bird of paradise, uh, many of them. And that's, uh, uh, you know, they're definitely fascinating pieces. Um, well, um, anybody else? Anybody? Uh, it's uh, it's a little after two o'clock, uh, so we want to thank everyone for uh, joining us for the long table. And John, thank you for such a great and engaging uh, uh, long table. We really appreciate it.